on some of these and have panels and this this thing you just suggested was a 10 minute or seven minute or whatever to have some experts i mean if borlaug was still among us we could have him but he's unfortunately expired in the middle of publishing this thing so um on these different subjects that were very important to us all because you know, the, the flights of people from Brazil and from Argentina become exorbitant and the time that they have to spend to be here. Mm -hmm. But this could bring us together in a meaningful way at, at points on our calendars, which would be easy because everybody's at their desk uh, communicating with everybody else. Um, just make one point that their, their webinar capability where somebody is doing it interactively does work to up to about 25 people max, <clears throat> where you have uh, somebody managing <clears throat> the interveners, and you only really have one or two people able to actually speak. However, you can log questions and comments and such yes, as they right. happen. Yes, that's right. Marilyn does. <clears throat> so that, that's yeah. right. But she yeah. has a lot more than 25 people. Yeah, but we found, we, we've used it a number of times. I'm not sure if what Marilyn, your, your experience is, but we found that we get a much, much, before, much beyond 20. A lot of people get left out and don't really get to comment, and they end up as passive observers. Actually, so. yeah, when, when Nietzsche spoke and did an amazing job, and those, the, she was getting, the, the questions were flying in from all over the world, and I've never seen anybody just knock off mm -hmm. those questions and answer them so well. So, so how big, how big a, an audience well, is we, practical? Well, we usually have 100 to 150 yeah. students. Yeah. Okay. So we're yeah. lot, and we were so, fortunate that we have an okay. audience of half So the, my point really is, though, that if we wish to have dialogues on specific things with other members of, uh, of uh, CORE and KCORE and, and, uh, and such, that it is a practical way to go yeah. <clears throat> if it's scheduled. But you really need one or two prime yeah. presenters uh, but with the dialogue created so that people do get to talk to each other. And, look, and you can use different people each time. I'd like to make sure that we're trying to say what are the priorities. And I think Anitra uh, has reviewed, as others, Madeline did, what the priorities were when we met years ago here to get started. So water clearly is a priority. Well, I think this economics is still poverty. Poverty. and poverty. And so what should we add? Do we need to add Bill and then Zach? I can't help but add that uh, nobody has talked about the role of cities and the sustainability of cities. Uh, the world has just gone from being partly <coughs> rural and partly urban to mostly urban. More than 50% of the world lives in urban areas. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, the growth of mega cities and China is foremost in doing that um, and, and in designing cities that size. Um, th there are all kinds of issues. Uh, the little blog I have is simply reviewing journal articles on pollution free cities, the name of the blog. Uh, but what it zeroes in on is traffic, pollution, and health, those three issues in an urban environment. Yeah. Uh, and so I would think somehow, as an issue to be addressed, <laughs> the future yeah. of the sustainability of cities or urban sustainability yeah. should be on the agenda. And there's more and more materials. My, my blog is viewed 10,000 times a month by people from over 200 <laughs> countries, as it stands now. But Bill's an meteorologist in case you didn't guess that, as well as a physicist. And he kept a log, a blog, I guess I'd call it, but you kept track of the pollution in the city of Ottawa for, you may be still doing it, for the environmental community. I have actually been, well, actually a little impatient with the models that I've been hearing. Most of them have been what some. Um, Bob Hoffman would call Newtonian. Um, he's an exception, so is Brad. Um, a great deal uh, of the modeling needs to uh, uh, 
start to involve complexity, the kind of things the Santa Fe Institute is doing. Very, very, very important. I do hope that will be part of further modeling. But even more than that, water? Think of salt water. Uh, what, 80% of the world's surface? 90, and, well, okay, 95% and, of the world's water. 97% of the world's and, water. And a huge heat uh, sink. It's affecting the, the where the where the, the, the planet is going. Uh, and and in, in in a much greater hurry than you might think, and um, I, I just think we've really got to start thinking about that. Uh, I'm sure you to a degree. Yes. <laughs> a lot of my sort of work is aimed at looking at. Just stand up Sorry. so people behind you can hear Sorry. you. Is aimed at sort of look. I really feel that we're, you know, we're on a we're in a phase transition, right? And that there's a change in conditions of change, and that, you know, cities. It's not just cities. Cities are now connected. It's not countries because now it's a, a, a supply chain that's more important than political boundaries, right? Where the digital environment is this huge thing that is connecting us all, the Internet of Things will bring real-time data from our, our kids may actually feel the ocean because of sensors and the way they're, you know. They're, in terms of an e economy, it's not just getting rid of neoliberal economy, which is a pseudoscience. There's a real possibility of an economy of abundance. Right? And that's a completely different type of economy, especially when you're looking at digital goods, non-rival goods. You know, I read that book, you haven't lost the book, right? I have this, where the whole notion of property, you know, this is what Eleanor Ostrom's work is about. That obliterated the argument of the, what is it, tragedy of the commons, which is the foundation for why private property is the way to allocate scarce resources. She's proven that when people can talk, they determine rules, and rules about changing the rules, commons are well managed. That's a different economy. So I think there's something we're missing here. You know, it's not taking what the problems of today and projecting it into tomorrow. There's a new world out there. There are new paradigms that we haven't even wrapped our head around, yeah. right? Yeah. And and that we need a think tank to start framing that, right? I mean, the conservatives have spent lots of money. They got a lot of billionaires building think tanks so that, like Lakoff says, you know, we t we talk about tax relief. Well, that's a frame of pain relief, right? That's where it comes from. It's a metaphor, mm -hmm. and that means. There's an affliction, somebody who gives you the affliction, and anybody who removes the affliction is a hero. No matter what facts you present around taxes, if you think of it in that frame, it's an affliction. We need to be able to frame these new paradigms, right? When we talk about values, that's so 